What is that sound I can hear? No, oh, it's somebody in the next site. It's from my side. Can you mute Sri that till you start? I will mute then. It, I'll mute. Yeah, yeah, because you have to speak. Uh, good evening, everybody. We're just going to start in about two minutes, five, five, five past five exactly. I think we can go ahead now. Live is started. A very good evening to everybody. Today is September 29th, 2021. A week from today, next Sunday, is September 5th, 2021. When we shall meet again, as we have met every September 5th, since that numbing Tuesday night, four years ago, when Gauri Lankesh, our dearest friend, comrade in arms, sister, daughter, and aunt, was shot dead in cold blood as she returned home from work late, not so late that night. The killers and the fanatical organization that killed her had been stalking her and had also most likely killed Narendra Dabolkar 2013, Govind Pansari 2015, M.M. Kalburgi, 2015. They tried to snuff out a brave, clear, laughing, rational voice that night. Little did they realize that in her death and killing, she scattered her sense of being and living across the land, over the seas and oceans. Voices encore, resonating with anger, tears, defiance and resolve at this bloody loss. The snatching away of our Gauri. Only... A day ago, we got the news that the city of Burnaby in Canada has declared September 5th Gauri Lankesh Day. Canadians of Indian origin had much to do to make that happen. The mural 
the mural dedication to Gauri Lankesh speaks of her commitment to scientific temper and against religious fanaticism. Apart from the small, tightly knit band of close associates and family who form the Gauri Memorial Trust and that fiery band of human rights foot soldiers who constitute a vast and growing band of human rights defenders at Citizens for Justice and Peace, we have precious participation today as always from Indira Amma, mother of Gauri and Kavita Lankesh, a sensitive and acclaimed filmmaker in her own right, who has with tears of dignity and courage been at the vanguard, not just of the movement to ensure that Gauri Lankesh and Parvati Lankesh's values resonate among our people, but has been doggedly pursuing legal remedy and that elusive word, justice for Gauri. At the trial, ongoing for four years now, and at the Supreme Court, when the accused exploit loopholes to escape the long and wide arm of the law, it has been my personal privilege and that of CJP to be a close ally in this fortitude-filled endeavor. To the advocates and counsel, senior counsel who have given of their time and commitment, we are so very grateful. Who are the Gauri Memorial Trust? The founding president, until recently, was the veteran freedom fighter, 103-year-old H.S. Dore Swami, who ran the publication house Sahitya Mandira, and the Indian nationalist newspaper Pauravani during colonial rule. Active during the freedom struggle, he continued his rigorous activism right until his passing and was known as the conscious keeper of Karnataka. Apart from myself, there is Deepu, filmmaker who runs pedestrian pictures, an alternative media house and a social activist. There's Ganesh Devi, well-known linguist, cultural critique and activist. We are privileged to have as patron Siddharth Vardarajan, editor and founder of The Wire and a noted journalist. Chukki Nanjudaswami, convener Rajya Raita Sangha, a premier farmers organization in Karnataka, founded by her father, late Professor Nanjudaswami. K. Neela, social activist and writer from Kal uh, uh, Kalburgi. Dinesh Amin Mattu, senior journalist and writer. K. L. Ashok, convener, Karnataka Communal Harmony Forum and social activist. Rehmat Tarikere, Professor of Kannad, Kannad University and a noted writer and cultural critique. A.S. Prabhakar, Professor of Kannad, Kannad, Kannada University, specialist in Adivasi culture and communities. <coughs> Abdul Salam Puttige, editor of Artha Bharti, a popular daily in coastal Karnataka. D. Narasimha Murthy, social activist and convener, Swaraj Abhiyan, Karnataka chapter. Muni Swami, Senior Dalit Activist, President Federation of Dalit Organizations in Karnataka. No Sridhar, Social and Political Activist, Convener Karnataka Jana Shakti. And none less than Professor V.S. Sridhara, Professor of English and Human Rights Activist. And now to today, a very special lecture in ongoing salute and tribute to our Gauri. Gautam Bhatia, Young Erudite a practicing lawyer and academic with close involvement in constitutional rights litigation, be it the privacy stroke Aadhaar case, the <clears throat> legal challenge to section 377 and criminalization of decriminalization of homosexuality and so many others. Author of Offense, Shock or Disturb, Freedom of Speech under the Indian Constitution 2016 and Transformative Constitution, a radical biography in nine acts 2019. He is also a science fiction writer. The subject and focus of today's lecture could not be more timely. Dissent is not treason, understanding national security laws. We really look forward to the event, the lecture, and the question and answer session after the lecture. Given the recent painful, shocking developments, especially the use of such national security laws, UAPA, NAC, state preventive detention laws, to incarcerate on false charges thousands of activists, academics, lawyers, and dissenters, the subject for us was the logical choice. To have a young and well-acclaimed lawyer and scholar, a deep thinker as it were, to deliver it is a real privilege. This lecture is also being streamed on CJP social media handles, including our Facebook. We are deeply grateful to Live Law for also live streaming it on their YouTube channel. Professor V. Sridhar will formally chair the session. After the question and answer following the lecture, we do look forward 
to his concluding remarks. Before I hand over to Professor Sridhara, I would just like to pay formal tribute and express our collective outrage at the Lati charge on protesting farmers yesterday by the Haryana police on the orders of a district magistrate. We also know <coughs> that UAPA and other draconian provisions have also been put against the peacefully protesting farmers. We also know that Isha Lankesh, Gauri's lovely niece, is today may not be able to be with us because she's at a hostel, but we'll catch the lecture later on on Facebook or YouTube. Gautam, we welcome you with a lot of all our hearts and with a lot of love. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tista, for the uh, nice introduction. And also pointing out what happened yesterday is very relevant for our concern because, uh, in fact, this series began with a, a talk by Justice Nagwan Das, retired High Court Justice of Karnataka on the Constitution of India. This is the third in the series, but second on the same topic of constitution. Today, you know, we all know that um, for us who are fighting for justice and human rights, constitution of India seems to be the biggest hope that even when it is completely battered, its clause, clause, clauses are violated, we can still rally around the basic tenets of constitution. So we really look forward to Gautam Bhatia's presentation on that. And uh, I'm sure that we will get more insights into the functioning of democracy in India and the role of constitution in that. So without much ado, I will uh, request uh, Gautam Bhatia to make his presentation. It will perhaps go about for about 40 to 45 minutes. Then I request uh, all the participants to post your questions on the chat box because that makes it easier and uh, simpler to avoid repetition. Uh, but we'll see to it that most of the questions asked will be responded to. Um, so with this, over to Gautam Bhatia. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much both for the, for the very kind introduction um, and for inviting me to speak. It's, it's a great honor to, to speak at the... Gauri Memorial Lecture. Um, and I think that uh, if there was one thing that really characterized uh, the work of, of Gauri Lankesh, it was uh, a skepticism towards all kinds of power and authority and the insistence on you know, a ruthless questioning of, of, all, of all that's there. And, and it's in that spirit that, um, that I want to frame uh, my remarks today. Uh, maybe a little more skeptical about not just um, the what's happening, but also about the proposed solutions and perhaps a little bit of skepticism about um, the way in which we speak about uh, the constitution these days as well. I want, to, I want to begin by setting out two quotes. Uh, the first quote is, goes as follows. You know, it, it says that uh, the court's judgments were wrong because their experience was limited to dealing with the crime after it has been committed. That's the first quote. The second quote is as follows. The power of preventive detention is precautionary power exercised reasonably in anticipation and may or may not relate to an offense. The anticipated behavior of a person based on his past conduct in the light of surrounding circumstances may provide sufficient ground for detention. The first quote is by Donald MacLeod, former Lieutenant Governor of colonial India, speaking of various provisions in the 1871 Criminal Tribes Act that had been struck down by the colonial courts. Donald MacLeod did not like that because he thought that the colonial courts were taking too generous a view and too liberal a view of notions of rights. Um, and because the Criminal Tribes Act had various provisions for so extensive surveillance of people, even without any indication of any crime having been committed, they deserved to you know, be held invalid. And Donald MacLeod said that you need to understand that it's not always, you, you, sometimes you have to put people you know, behind bars even before crimes are committed. The second quote is by the Supreme Court of India after independence under the constitution in a case called Sukhpal Singh. 
And I want us just to think about uh, the similarities and not just the similarities, but the differences. Because the first quote is by a colonial executive official who is criticizing colonial courts set up by the British because they don't seem to understand that you should be able to put people in jail before crimes have been committed. And the second is a quote by the court, by a court saying that, well, yes, you know, the whole point is to put people in jail before crime has been committed. Um, and, and, and in between these two courts, you have many decades and you have a constitution. Uh, and, and still, uh, the similarity is, is very striking. And I think that it's worth thinking about, uh, you know, in a little more detail. So le moving on, leading from that, I, I think I think there are, there are basically a, a, there have been three lines of thought um, when it comes to the record of civil rights in independent India in the context of the constitution and the courts. The first line of thought has been that, well, after independence, there was a period of around two decades when the courts were still, you know, they had a colonial hangover. They were still finding their feet. Uh, the the abyss was reached with the judgment in the habeas corpus case, ADM Jabalpur versus Shafkan Shukla. Uh, after that, there was a course correction. Um, and uh, and then, you know, um, now things have, have improved after it in the PIL era. So that's that's the, the first line of thought. And of course, there are a few aberrations. Sorry, one second. Right. Yeah. So the, the second, the second line of thought um, is that that there have there is not it has not there has not been one breaking point or or one point at which there was this big change in the Supreme Court's behavior. Uh, but over time, uh, since independence, there has been a more consistent trend of judicial deference towards national security laws, towards laws that establish a state of exception, uh, that depart from normal criminal law principles, that depart from uh, basic protections of rights and criminal law statutes. And that has been a, a consistent trend. Uh, but the reason for that is that our judges have consistently failed to correctly interpret and understand the constitution. Uh, they have chosen to interpret the constitution in a way that accords with what the executive wants, with again, a few exceptions, with a few courageous exceptions. Uh, but the constitution is great. The constitution is good. Uh, you know, it's, it's progressive constitution, it's transformative. Um, and the problem has been bad judges. So it's a problem of bad judges and a good constitution. And if we're just able to, you know, make really good arguments about how to interpret the constitution, if we're able to have the right judges in place, over time, there will be more progress towards you know uh, a, a civil rights protection and and there will be more resistance against national security laws sacrificing civil rights at the altar of a broader public interest that's the second line of thought and i think that that i, I think the first line of thought is definitely wrong and, and i think it's almost at this point intellectually dishonest to continue holding on to that uh, because there comes a point at which the aberrations grow so numerous and so voluminous that they're no longer aberrations, right? So, and I, it's hard to forget that just two days ago, we were at the third anniversary of the of the arrest of four of the uh, individuals involved in the Bhima Koregaon case involving Sudha Bharadwaj and others. Uh, their bail has been uh, denied at every level of the judiciary, at, at every, every, every court on multiple occasions. Um, and I think that that when you have cases like that piling up, you really can't say that these are aberrations anymore. Uh, and so I think the first the first uh, account has been thoroughly discredited. The second account is somewhat more persuasive, but I think that that it suffers from a number of, of problems as well. Uh, and I think that an honest reckoning with the problem that we face needs to take into account the role of the constitution uh, in enabling a number of issues that are there before us today. So I don't think it's as simple a case of a good constitution and bad judges. I think that there are various design features and structural issues in the constitution that make 
bad judges able to do what they're doing. And I wouldn't even say bad judges. I think judges of, of any color. Um, I, the constitutional text, its, its structure and its history allows for certain things to happen. And it need not have been this way. And so I think that we need to, we need to go back um, to the founding moment. We need to study that a little more carefully um, and, and to see how there is a continuity between the colonial times and the post-colonial times. And of course, these, the, the argument that there's a continuity between, between the colonial and the post-colonial times is an argument that's often made, but that the constitution forms a part of this continuity is I think an argument that was initially made in the 1950s by a number of, of critics. Um, and it, it still continues to be made, um, especially when we, we speak about issues in, in Kashmir and, and, and in, in those areas. Uh, but in the mainstream, I think that that, that has been somewhat muted um, and it, it may need us to perhaps talk about that again. So I want to actually spell out uh, what that continuity entails. Uh, but before that, I'll say that national security laws laws that establish a state of exception, whether it's the UAPA uh, or the NSA, laws that came before the TADA, the POTA and so on, I think are characterized by four features. Uh, so even though their provisions are, are very different and their, their provisions can, um, you know, uh, they, do, they do different things, there are a number of different state statutes. I think if you look at it from a bird's eye perspective, you find four common features. The first is executive supremacy. Uh, which means that it is basically the executive's decision when to trigger, uh, you know, a, a legal regime that is effectively effectively takes us from the state of normalcy to the state of exception. Uh, and then within the statute, you have set up a self-referential regime of accountability, where the executive effectively sits in judgment over complaints against abuse of power by itself. Uh, so that's that's the first feature. The second feature is the, is the denial of remedies. So there is a limit upon the role that independent bodies can play to check abuse and impunity. The classic example, of course, is 43D5 of the UAPA. You know, we, we all talk about that all the time because you know it's kind of it, it, it is the thing, right? It is the thing right now that is being used to ensure that people stay in prison um, for, a, for a very long time. And I, I see in the audience there are many, there are many council who have really you know, fought against that uh, and do it every day. Uh, so that's the second, the second um, aspect of these of these laws. Uh, the third aspect is the jurisdiction of suspicion, a phrase that I borrow from Justice Bague's majority opinion in the habeas corpus case. Uh, so normally, when you think about criminal law, what criminal law needs is a tight causal link between the crime and the person responsible for it. So you have an offense, so an, an act. That's the criminal act. You have the person who is accused of committing that act and need to establish a very clear causal link between the two to establish um, guilt, liability, whatever it is. Whereas in national security statutes, often that chain of causation is attenuated to the point of almost non-existence. Um, you know, so whether it is the criminalization of associations or groups, uh, what you have effectively is uh, this, this preemptive um, a preemptive guilt by association almost, that who you associate with, who you're seen in company with, what books or materials that you have that you read, uh, what you have said in the past, um, you know, uh, that is taken itself as, as proof of your, of your complicity uh, in what finally is, say, an offense, without the need to really establish that there was a chain of causation that led from the former to the latter. And the, th and the fourth is a rhetorical point, and that is uh, the statement, again, it's, a, it's originally a Latin statement. I wouldn't read out Latin, there's, there's no need, but basically public welfare as supreme law. So the idea that the purpose of these statutes is to provide for public welfare, for public safety, uh, and in this amorphous idea of what constitutes the public, um, the rights of individuals are basically submerged. Uh, so we are never told what constitutes the public. We're never told what exactly the, the threat is to the public that these laws are meant, meant to prevent other than, again, quite vague statements. But we are told that as long as public safety is, is involved, the rights of individuals have to take a secondary status. So that is the, is the, is the fourth um, 
is, is the fourth characteristic of this legal regime. And I think that, that what you see is if you, if you go into the colonial times and then the debates around the framing of the constitution and then the post-colonial times, you see that these four characteristics are repeated in each of these three eras. Uh, and to, I think, um, to address, to tackle, to solve the problem, uh, we need to think about how we are going to tackle each of these um, issues, both as they are found in statutes, in laws, and as they are found in the public discourse and in people's imaginations. So therefore, I'll divide this, the rest of, of, of these remarks into these three phases, the colonial times, the framing of, of the constitution, uh, and then, of course, the, the post-colony. So in the colonial times, the, the permanent state of exception that was established by the colonial regime uh, was basically anchored to the sweeping powers enjoyed by the unelected political executive, that is the governor general. So the governor general's office was vested with the powers to issue ordinances, having the force of law that, of course, still exists under the constitution uh, in emergency situations. And the ordinance making power was what was most frequently used to authorize preventive detention. Now, I think, first of all, I, I, I follow uh, what the criminal lawyer and scholar Abhinav Sekri says when he says that preventive detention is a phrase that's really a misnomer. It, it kind of almost legitimizes um, what's being done by using the term preventive detention. A far better term is executive detention or administrative detention, because what you're doing is you're detaining people and depriving them of liberty. Um, without without trial and judicial determination of guilt, so what you should be calling it should be by you should be call, calling it what it is, which is executive detention uh, or at best administrative detention. So I think executive detention is the word that I would like um, to use. So the ordinance making power of the unelected governor general was was often utilized uh, to issue orders authorizing executive detention. Um, and even after the incremental growth of representative institutions in India, under the 1919 and 1935 Government of India Acts, uh, the Governor General continued to possess overriding powers of legislation, um, effectively making the partially elected legislative assemblies subservient to the executive. Um, and these powers were at the Governor General's satisfaction and therefore almost unreviewable uh, by the courts. So you have there already uh, executive supremacy and the denial of remedies as being inherent and, and as part of the legal landscape. While this was most frequently in use during the two world wars, there was also a parallel legislative and executive framework that replicated many of the features of the state of exception, even in peacetime. So it wasn't just a wartime measure. Uh, as early as 1818, which is um, 200 years ago, uh, a little more than that, the Bengal regulation, that was the first that authorized executive detention for the preservation of tranquility and security from either foreign intervention or, and the phrase was internal commotion. And I think it's a very telling, telling phrase, internal commotion. Uh, of course, you had in the interwar years, the Rowlett Act, which became the flashpoint for nationalist protests, authorized executive detention for up to two years. The Emergency Powers Ordinance of 1932, also a peacetime measure, uh, was used both to ban organizations, and that brings us to the jurisdiction of suspicion, banning associations, and to impose a regime of executive detention. And then, so these statutes are often, you know, they're discussed, they're talked about, but I think actually the, the statute that, that really foreshadows a lot of what we are seeing today is the one that I began these remarks with, which is the 1871 Criminal Tribes Act. Um, because that, I think if you actually look at the UAPA and the Criminal Tribes Act, the closest associations you see, some of them, are actually in those two statutes. Um, you know, because the Criminal Tribes Act was an act whose defining feature was to establish guilt by association. Um, the Criminal Tribes Act labeled entire tribes as presumptively criminal, um, established a regime of surveillance reporting to the police subject to penal consequences, uh, forced relocation to labor camps, and so on. Uh, actual commission of an offense was not required, as long as the official concerned formed a subjective satisfaction that the individual and the groups in question had the potential to commit crimes. Uh, blood or kin relationships with designated criminals uh, 
was sufficient for the act to apply, uh, representing a complete inversion of the basic criminal law principle of individual responsibility. Um, and the justification for this, this entire repressive legal regime um, was the special character of, of the colony, that Indians were not ready for self-governance, were not ready for self-determination, and therefore you had to have these repressive kinds of provisions. I think that's important because you see that rhetoric replicated during the framing of the Indian constitution. Now, but before we go there, I think what's really important and interesting is that there was a nationalist response to all of this. And the nationalist response took a, co a constitutional form. So it wasn't just a political critique that was made of the British legal landscape, but a constitutional critique. Um, and so, for example, in various presidential addresses of the Indian National Congress, stalwarts like Motilal Nehru and C.R. Das critiqued this legal regime from the perspective of constitutional rights, of freedoms, and of, of liberties. Motilal Nehru, for example, in 1919, specifically argued that you cannot, on the basis that there might be some people who are endangering public safety or public peace, uh, impose a law that effectively, presumptively criminalizes the entire population and then requires people to bear the burden of disproving that they are co committing an offense. Uh, and that a regime in which ultimately the sole determination of that question lies with the executive uh, is effectively a, a regime that completely goes gives a go-by to the rule of law and to any kind of constitutionally valid form. Um, and, and he says that, that, and this is really interesting because it, it could be that he's talking about 43D5, his specific words are that no executive in the world, however competent it may be, has any business to usurp the jurisdiction of duly constituted courts or deprive the people of the protection afforded by them. And if you look at 43D5, that's exactly what's happening there because it, what it does is it effectively imposes a bar upon courts from granting bail. Uh, as long as the police version is internally consistent. Right? That's effectively what that section does. Um, it is a statutory bar. And of course, we will we'll come to some of the ways the courts have, have I think, very, um, very uh, um, astutely managed to grant bail despite those provisions. But that is effectively what's happening here. Um, and you see how that exact critique was being made uh, 100 years ago uh, against the colonial legal regime. Um, and, and similarly, C.R. Das, three years later, uh, said that the personal liberty of every Indian today depends to a great extent on the exercise by persons in authority of wide, arbitrary, or discretionary powers. Where such powers are allowed, the rule of law is denied. So the direct link between the rule of law and the granting of discretionary or arbitrary powers to executive, to executive bodies. Now, you can multiply examples of this kind of critique that was made uh, of the uh, the British legal regime by nationalist figures, by freedom fighters. There were figures like Satyamurti in the Government of India Act 1935. In council, he made the critique. Uh, and there were many other figures right up to independence. Hansa Mehta during World War II criticized the imposition of an emergency and so on. And so there was, there was this unbroken tradition uh, of freedom fighters, of nationalists, of, of, of Congress people uh, arguing that what was illegitimate about the legal landscape of these national security laws that the British imposed was that they were so far away from any kind of effective guarantee of protecting the rights and freedoms of people um, that, that and that is what made them illegitimate. So, so that, that constitutional critique is a really important part of our pre-independence history. Um, and it's, it's really important to understand that because that is what makes the break at the time of the framing of the constitution um, very a very important and b also shows us that it needn't have been like this. Uh, it, it this need not have been the path that we took. There were other paths that were open to us. And so with that, we can now look at the constituent assembly itself. Um, and 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 of course, the starting point is something that is very obvious and so obvious that it almost needs a counterintuitive kind of an argument to go against it, um, which is that India is almost unique among the constitutions of the world uh, in that it specifically authorizes 
an executive detention regime under Article 22. And not only that, the insertion of Article 22 into the constitution was strongly resisted by multiple members of the Constituent Assembly, precisely on the grounds of individual liberty and state overreach. So you had that entire tradition of constitutional argument that was being made throughout our history against the British. Um, and that argument was continued into the Constituent Assembly against the, uh, well, the dominant faction that wanted to maintain those provisions and in fact, entrench them into the new constitution. Now, defenders of that regime deployed a very broad set of arguments, um, ranging from the precarious communal situation that existed at that time uh, to an expression of faith that the new government of independent India would not seek to abuse or exploit provisions that the colonial regime had freely invoked to stifle dissent. And ultimately, uh, therefore, executive retention remained in the constitution. Uh, and if you if you actually look at the debate that that went into the, the the framing of that provision, there was a particularly stormy debate over whether what finally became Article Twenty One, which guarantees the right to life and personal liberty, should include a due process clause on the lines of the U.S. Constitution. That is to say, that should the term should, when the state wants to deprive a person of life or liberty. Should they follow due process as in the US Constitution or simply procedure established by law, which of course is the text of the Constitution today? Um, some members argued that due process would allow the court far reaching powers of interference in government policy, as the US experience had recently shown, including in welfare policy and so on. And on the other hand, but on the other hand, if you omitted due process and just had the term procedure established by law, then the court's role would become minimal. Uh, life and personal liberty, and after a very, very stormy debate on that, finally, uh, the due process clause was dropped. So then at that point, you only had um, the term procedure established by law, uh, and then you had the executive detention regime. Now, in order to provide a degree of constitutional protection to individuals against arbitrary arrest, in response to the dropping of the due process clause, Ambedkar introduced what then became Article 22, Clause 1 and 2 of the Constitution, uh, which is that the, the requirement that uh, you need to be produced before a judicial authority within 24 hours um, of, of an arrest under Article 22, Clause 1 and 2, and then Clauses 3 to 7 have exceptions to that if there is an executive detention law that's actually in force. So Articles 22, Clause 1 and 2 were therefore introduced um, by Ambedkar to bring about some measure of protection after the due process clause was dropped. But what you can see is that that is an almost negligible kind of a protection uh, because A, it's just it just has to do with production before a judicial body within 24 hours. And B, it that provision itself is subject to any law that provides for executive detention in the first place. Uh, so on the one hand, you dropped the due process clause that would have actually led to possibly a much greater judicial scrutiny uh, of you know, laws that seek to deprive individuals of, of freedom. And you replace that uh, with a very bare bones procedural safeguard of production before a judicial authority. And that's why in the assembly, it's, it was specifically called a compromise and criticized on the basis of, of it being a, a very, very thin kind of a compromise. Um, and, and so that, that ultimately is, is what the constitution gave us. Um, and Ambedkar, after a six hour long debate in September, 1949, um, he, he, he says in the constituent assembly that I'm trying to in some way restore the content of due process in its fundamentals uh, without using the words due process. And so that's what that's what we were left with then. Um, and I think that that this um, this is something that that would then haunt our jurisprudence from the very beginning, because what effectively we got was these widespread powers that the state was given uh, to curtail individual freedoms, rights, and liberties on the altar of a broader public interest, public safety, and public security. And then there was almost a half-hearted afterthought 
of a protection that would that that and and the logic was okay well we may have gone a bit too far uh, in doing this let's try and pull it back in you know a little bit um, and 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 if you look at the judgments of the supreme court after independence you see that kind of logic repeating itself time and time again where the basic legitimacy and the validity of that four prong lo- those four prong logic i mentioned in 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 the beginning executive supremacy denial of remedies uh the jurisdiction of suspicion and public welfare that based that that basic logic is the starting point from which we begin our discussion and then we ask ourselves oh have we gone too far do we need to maybe put it back a bit right that logic then then continues throughout our post independence history and i think it's really important to challenge that logic by its very root because we are not we are not going to ultimately secure uh, in in my view uh, constitutional freedom constitutional liberty by conceding in the very beginning that yes the the those, those four prongs are are fine in principle but we just need to tinker at the edges to ensure that you know they're not abused uh, at some later point uh, so on that let's actually see some of the cases that came after uh the constitution was drafted now you know adm jabalpur the habeas corpus cases as as i said in the beginning uh taken to be this you know this this moment of great shame uh, this this moment in which the abyss was was plumbed um you know and this and it was this you know there was the emergency and the court was under pressure you know and and bad things happened and all of that um but in a, in a in a wonderful article called adm jabalpur's antecedents Uh, the scholar kalyani ramnath points out that actually there was a whole range of cases before adm jabalpur that said the same thing and when you actually read adm jabalpur what you are struck by is actually the amount of precedent the judges in the majority were able to cite to support their conclusions so they did not just say that oh um, today for the first time we uphold the suspension of article 21 today for the first time uh, we uphold the executive supremacy in determining what to do in an emergency they cited the unbroken precedent both from colonial times and the previous 20 years uh, to justify their position for example you had the case of of makhan singh versus state of punjab in 1964 um, which involved the emergency proclamation arising out of the war with china uh, where the supreme court after two years after where the supreme court basically it had held uh that the proclamation barred the right to move the courts for any remedy uh, including those under specific statutes such as the crpc you know so and 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 while you may say okay the constitution uh in its text says that well it used to say before the 44th amendment after the emergency it used to say um that during an emergency the rights under under part three of the constitution are suspended so you can say okay the courts hands are tied uh if the text specifically says that the rights under part 3 are suspended the court cannot then allow for those rights to to you know be enforced but the constitution never said that the crpc is suspended during an emergency that was a choice that the court made uh, a choice that followed this whole logic uh of uh, of conceding to the basic legitimacy of the national security statute uh logic that is the four pronged um set of 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 issues executive supremacy and so on um and so you see that that before adm jabalpur you had this whole range uh, of cases uh, that that did this after adm jabalpur you had actually much the same thing uh, the scholar ujwal kumar singh basically says that what has happened is that there is a regime of interlocking legal systems uh, where the state of exception and the state of normalcy has become have become so enmeshed with each other uh, that what was meant or is supposed to be a temporary and defined situation uh, has been converted into a permanent and undefined one uh, and i think that one of the stark examples of this is the judgment in ak roy's case uh, which came which came actually 3 years after the emergency was was over in 1980 uh and, and 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 at the time at which we are told that the court had turned over a new leaf the pils you know had had come in and and things were changing uh, that's when you had the ak roy's case where the constitutionality of the nsa uh, was upheld and the nsa of course is one of the still remaining national security laws that are still used that are still used uh, on a very regular regular basis um 
And in AK Roy, the court held that uh, a chain of authority and accountability that solely involved executive action, that is the commissioner of police as the detaining authority, subject to review powers by the central government um, was constitutionally valid. And furthermore, that the trigger for the government exercising its powers of preventive detention uh, was its subjective satisfaction that a person needed to be prevented from acting in any manner prejudicial to the defense of India, the relations of India, and so on. Basically, the sub clauses you find in Article 19, Clause 2 um, was actually fine. And I want to quote what the court said because I think it's really important and, and it's, it's, it speaks to the issue of, of the fact that the problem is not so much um, you know, bad judges and a good constitution, but actually it's a continuing perspective that's been taken on these laws. Uh, so what the court says is that, and this is in response to an argument that the clauses of the NSA are too vague and therefore allow for you know, much abuse to take place. Uh, court says that there are expressions which inherently comprehend such an infinite variety of situations that definitions, instead of lending them a definite meaning, can only succeed either in robbing them of their intended amplitude. If it is permissible to the, to the legislature to enact laws of, of preventive detention, a certain amount of minimal latitude has to be conceded to it in order to make those laws effective. Uh, that we consider to be a realistic approach to the situation. Though an expression may appear in cold print to be vague and uncertain, it may not be difficult to apply it to life's practical realities." Uh, close quote. Uh, you know, a, a counsel, I've, I've forgotten who it was, uh, you know, I think a year or so ago, uh, he called the Supreme Court's approach to habeas corpus um, in, uh, in Kashmir a hope and trust to respondents, that, you know, the court would express hope and trust that the government would do the right thing, but not do anything itself. Uh, and what you see here is what the court said is that actually, yes, when we look at the provisions of the NSA, we see that on paper, uh, you know, they are vague and uncertain. But we are, we are we express hope and confidence, hope and trust that when it comes to applying them, they will somehow magically become certain and they will become precise uh, when we apply when the government applies them to to a, a real life situation. Uh, you know, and that takes us back to again uh, the, the the fundamental premise, uh, which is that the moment you have a law that ostensibly claims to be in service of national security, national interest public safety or so on, um, the, uh, the, the four, those four prongs that I'd mentioned kick in. Um, and, and the court basically says that, yes, you know, like we, we, we basically concede to the premise of the whole legislation. Um, and, you know, whether if there are some problems, if there are some issues, you know, we, we still think that they'll work themselves out in implementation, but only when there is something that's so blatant or, you know, completely cannot pass muster, uh, is when the court sometimes steps in. In the NSA case itself, it struck down a couple of provisions that were, I think, too blatant even for it. Um, but otherwise, the presumption is that this is needed and this this must remain. And as I said, it's that its roots actually lie in the framing of the constitution and in the specific provisions um, and in the way that they came about. So you started with this broad kind of of leeway given to the government under Articles 21 and 22 and then tried to pull back its worst abuses um, by you know, a, a couple of provisions that would attempt to, in some extreme cases, slightly soften its, its impact. Um, the other you know, uh, really, I think, um, stark example is the case of Kartar Singh versus State of Punjab, which upheld the constitutional validity of, of TADA, um, which, 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 as it then stood. Uh, now, TADA made a number of departures from basic principles of, of criminal law, um, including what is now 43D5 of the UAPA in, in a slightly different form, which is that, um, that if there is a prima facie case uh, that is made out, uh, then there is a statutory bar upon the grant of bail. And as everyone has pointed out, this is so obvious that it doesn't even need analysis, is that the prima facie case is the state case. At the time of bail, that is the case that the police shows to the court. Um, so you're basically asking uh, the accused to, uh, you're tying one hand behind their back, both hands behind their back. So you're saying that, that you can't bring your own evidence to disprove the prosecution's case. Um, all you can show is at its highest that the prosecution's case fails on its own terms, as some inconsistency or 
it's so shoddy that it doesn't even make you know the prima facie case and if you can't show that um, then um, effectively you stay in jail until the trial gets over which is which is many many years and of course after the supreme court judgment in vatali's case which again we have talked about you know, so many times um, that has been made even harder because that has that has that has made it even harder for the defense to uh, to challenge any aspect of the prosecution's case on substantive terms at the stage of bail under the UAPA. So you, but you had Kartar Singh that brought it about. You had a constitutional challenge to it in, in Kartar Singh. Um, and, uh, and you had the Supreme Court upholding uh, that, that provision on the basis that because terrorists don't act like normal criminals, therefore you need something special to deal with them. And of course, what that ignores is that no one's a terrorist until they're actually proven so in a court of law. So the stage of bail, at the stage of anticipatory bail, another issue in Qatar Singh, at the stage of not revealing the grounds of detention to the detainee, at the stage of uh, witness, protected witnesses and what kinds of, of you know, uh, limits that the statute put on cross-examination. At all those stages, uh, the defense is still representing an accused, not a convicted uh, person. And so therefore, what you're saying is that our assumption actually is that everyone who is an accused under a law like TADA, a national security law of that kind, is actually presumptively guilty. So we are going to judge uh, our legal standards under national security laws. We are going to judge our uh, the legal framework on the assumption that the trial is of a guilty person. And, we, and we'll ask ourselves that well, so, okay, so if you let a guilty person go out and bail a terrorist, then actually they'll obviously use that liberty to, you know, threaten witnesses. Um, in, and sometimes we need to stop, uh, you know, terror, guilty terrorists from cross-examination and so on, uh, and all of those restrictions. Uh, so again, the underlying premise um, is not simply a, a premise that deals with, you know, judicial deference or, or, you know, just allowing for a certain kind of abuse. But it's a much deeper thought process um, that that starts with the assumption that under these under these special laws, um, we, we, are, we are starting off with with the assumption that um, everyone who comes within the net is, is guilty, and we need to deal with with those people, uh, and and we need to therefore change our legal structure uh, to to deal with that. And that again goes back to, uh, I, in my view, the framing of the constitution. And that basic that basic sense that your starting point is no due process, executive detention that can be extended indefinitely. Uh, that's your starting point as being constitutional and correct and valid and good. And then we'll see what we can do to maybe you know soften its effects effects a little bit. Um, and and you had so you had that you have that very clearly coming across in the uh, in the in the NSA judgment in A.K. Roy, you have that very clearly coming across in Kartar Singh. Um, you have that coming across in Naga People's Movement for Human Rights, the case that upheld the AFSPA's constitutionality, where entire areas can be declared to be, uh, you know, regions effectively off limits to, to fundamental rights um, and so on. So, so, then, so that's why I say that the continuity that we're talking about is not just a colonial and post-colonial continuity. But it's a continuity that's punctuated by the constitution and in many ways enabled and facilitated by it. Now, the final thing that I want to flag briefly is that now, of course, I mean, this, this may look like a very pessimistic uh, you know, story and you know, um, it may look like uh, that, that if, there is, if this has been a 200 year unbroken chain, then you know, it's very hard to, to, um, uh, to, to, to displace now. But what we have seen is that even even this kind of, of legal regime does give spaces uh, to courts, to lawyers, um, to work through the interstices and to still to still do something that, that's good for, for freedom and for liberty. And I'll give two examples and uh, briefly, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, you know end with, with those two examples and just a, a closing remark. And the first is the famous Kabir Kalamanch bail judgments of the Bombay High Court um, in 2013, uh, when um, when the court basically used the Supreme Court's judgment in Arup Buyan and those cases to say that when the UAP talks about membership of, uh, of an unlawful association or a terrorist gang, then that the term membership refers only to active membership 
and therefore you need to show that the individual involved was themselves um you know party to inciting violence and you can't just use this kind of broad ideas of conspiracy uh, of associations to you know uh, to bring them in into jail uh, and and using that justice to say then granted bail to various members of the kabir kala manch the second of course is the much more recent judgment in asif ikbal uh, tana and in the, you know justice bambani's judgment where he does something very similar because what um uh because what um when when the when when the statute says that uh, as long as there is a prima facie case you cannot grant bail then all you can do is you can say that there is no prima facie case if if bail is to be granted and to do that you have to show that the facts collected by the police uh, don't reach the legal requirements of the offense in the first place so even if you take all the facts to be true um the offense is not made out even on those facts so there's no prima facie case and so then that requires you to interpret what the offense actually requires so in justice uh, tipse's judgment in the kabir kala manch cases um he says that the offense requires active membership to 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 be established and therefore you must show that there was incitement to violence in justice bambani's judgment he says that the word terrorism uh, is, is itself a very very specific term and you can't use it to and you can't expand its definition to just take into account anything uh any kind of public disorder and so you see that it it is still possible um for judges uh to be able to use um a restrictive law uh, and still interpret it uh, very correctly and in consonance with all with all um correct methods of interpretation uh, to nonetheless say that that um there is still scope for bail to be granted in these kinds of cases um but i think that what's important is to remember that even with these judgments effectively it is still a, a very um, it's very, it's very imp- these judgments are extremely important uh, but the the impact is nonetheless still very marginal because well one thing is you can't always rely upon having judges who will understand the importance of of liberty and freedom and you know work to to um write judgments that will fulfill that 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 promise you can't rely on that and i think we, we all know that um but but secondly i think as long as that basic logic that in my view underpins the constitution um and uh, and continue and has continued onwards as long as that basic logic remains in place where the starting point is legitimate and we are just concerned with how to pull it back um ultimately we'll always be fighting against the the tide uh, because the entire argument will then be that you know uh, at what point does abuse become so much abuse that it's no longer tolerable uh, but that's a very limited kind of argument um, that that that's being made because the issue ultimately is not that these are okay laws that are being abused by unprincipled state functionaries the argument is that abuse is baked into uh, into these laws so there's no distinction between use and abuse and i think the challenge is uh, is b- before us it is how to to um to articulate that argument in a way that that is effective you know in the public sphere in courts and and so on and and i think and i'll close with this that that perhaps then it that means it's actually time to 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 go back to the founding of the constitution um and to maybe ask some hard questions um about um about whether if if we are going to stick to uh, uh if we are going to stick to the um the story that the constitution is good and judges are bad um if that ultimately is going to just limit um how we can identify the problem and maybe resolve it so i think with that thought um i will i will close i see it's just uh, 45 minutes so on that thought i'll close and and you know uh, thank you for again for for inviting me thank you very much both them very much we'll take some questions now which have come in and uh, you know i just thought that the first question which has come in uh, to me is regard is your remark which you made i think twice in the lecture which is about the 1871 uh, act of the under the british that is the criminal uh, De- uh, criminalization of tribes act what were the socio political circumstances specifically the uh, questioner asked that led to the enactment of that statute yeah, so i think that were, would be very critical no 
Yeah, there were, there were many, and, and I think that I would recommend a book called Dishonored by History uh, by Meena yeah. Rajadaksha that really goes into the full history of the Criminal Tribes Act. Yeah. Um, so there were many, many things. So one was that um, one was that there was this entire British idea of hereditary crime. You know that that uh, there are certain in 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 Europe and in England you have the gypsies and the Roma. You know who are believed to just be criminals by nature and by birth. Um, so there was this whole idea of hereditary crime, and these and because these um, indigenous groups um, were groups that effectively you know were nomadic, um, their con their concepts of property were different. Um, and uh, they did not, and, and they were difficult, it was difficult to tax them because you know, they, were, they were nomadic and because they were parts of supply chains that were alternatives to the British political and economic interests. A uh, combination of all these factors um, brought into place a law like the Criminal Tribes Act. Um, but the basic justification in the public sphere that the British gave um, was that there are these tribes who are just addicted to crime uh, and like parents pass on that addiction to the children. Uh, so it's basically, it's basically you're, you're criminal by birth, by association, by blood, by kin. And the only way to stop that is to uh, criminalize the groups as a whole. Um, and, and then to, to put them into labor camps uh, and so on. So that, that, those are the set of circumstances that, that, um, that um, led to the enactment of the Criminal Tribes Act. And then over time, its implementation right up to 19, I think, I think it was 19, in the 1950s, it was finally repealed. Um, and they were called the denotified mm -hmm. tribes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gautam. There was another question, which is uh, that, uh, which is from uh, Deborah Gray. It says that mm -hmm. when it comes to cases under national security laws, yeah. is it established that burden of proof lies on the accused, like in the citizenship laws in Assam? Or is the presumption of guilt just another example of authoritarian regimes abusing their power? Sorry, sorry, I didn't quite understand. Could you, could you repeat that? Uh, yeah, sure. That under national security laws, is it established that burden of proof lies on the accused like in the citizenship laws in Assam? Or is the presumption of guilt just another example of authoritarian regimes assuming their power? No, so it's not it's not that the final the the the, mm. the burden of, of proof of innocence is on the is on the accused. It's 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 just that there are a number of steps along the way in which various burdens are placed uh, upon the accused. So, uh, for example, in the in the NDPS and the drug laws, you have you have a presumption based on possession, uh, you know, and then the accused has to has to kind of displace that presumption. Uh, in the UAPA, you have the bail you have the bail uh, provisions where basically the accused effectively has to you know. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a burden of proof issue, but it's more that that um, that the the cost of of keeping the the accused in jail is basically very, very low. Uh, the, the, the legal, the, the things the state has to prove, has just, it just has to show that there was a prima facie case. And actually, it's not even a burden of proof question because if the state shows a prima facie case is there, uh, then after Batali, you can't even object to that. So, you, I mean, it's not, you basically, it's not even that you have an impossible burden. You're not even allowed to discharge any kind of burden uh, other than the burden of showing the state's case is internally contradictory. Uh, so I think that actually, it, so it, as far as I know, and subject to correction, uh, we don't have a statutory regime where, which actually explicitly says that that um, you are deemed to be guilty until proven innocent at the final stage. But you have these kind of departures from this principle at various stages, like like bail, um, you know, um, possession, and so on, which 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 lead to many of the issues. <clears throat> Thanks. From Karuna John, there are voices against laws such as UAPA. Do you think that public pressure or will public pressure, if it grows, result in par parliament repealing it? Father Stan's death has put a global spotlight on the law afresh. Um, I think if you look at history, uh, Tada and, and, uh, and, and Pota um, both uh, ultimately went in no small part because of sustained public pressure. So I think that public pressure is extremely important. Um, and and it's it's extremely uh, it's it's indispensable. It, it but what we've also seen is that they go in and they come back in a morphed form, right? So UAPA two thousand eight is the is kind of like the intellectual successor of, <coughs> of Pada and then Pota. Uh, so I think that that it, it public pressure is important. But what are the terms under which we are we are framing the argument? So if you're just going to say that UAPA is being abused. You know, uh, it needs to go because it's being abused. Look at illustration A, B, C, and D. 
um, of abuse. Well, maybe someday we may be successful and it may go, but you know, you would just then have then have, I don't know, uh, national protection of people from something act, you know, which will which will just make a few little little modifications and you will be back with the same problem. So I think ultimately, perhaps we need to perhaps we need to also think about you know how we are framing our objection to the UAP and and if, if we can find a way to frame it in a way in a manner that that questions the, the underlying legitimacy to start with of a national security law that sees the need to depart from our core principles, you know, like presumption of innocence, responsibility being having to be established to prove a crime and so on. Um, if, if we can somehow find a way to, to frame our objections in those terms, then I don't know. I mean, this is all tentative. Uh, then, you know, that, that may may get us to a better place at some point in the future. Just my addition to that question is that given what you have very, very explicitly and repeatedly explained about Article 22 itself and its inclusion in the Constitution, uh, how should that campaign be then framed? Because given the fact that the Constitution has given legitimacy to some extent or large extent to the fact that we should have some form of national security law which Parliament can sometimes make a UAPA, sometimes make a TADA, sometimes that is why where these laws find their legitimacy finally. So how, 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 how do we need to sharply focus that debate, public debate? So I think that, um, I think that this is a question that I think requires a lot, lot more, I think maybe even, even just discussion about how it can be framed. Um, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, maybe just like give a pat answer, uh, you know, uh, but, I, but, I, but I think, but I think that at least, and, I, and this is just my, my personal view, uh, I think that as long as Article 22 is, is there in the Constitution, uh, it's it, the, it, we're not going to get very far. And and um, and, and I know that constitutional amendment is always a, a dangerous kind of proposition. There are a lot of like a lot of various issues that are involved in that kind of a movement. So I don't want to prescribe um, prescribe something, but. But what I will say is that I think I used to think for the longest time that it's it's possible to take the text of Article 22 and 21, and despite the history, to read it in a way that will that is progressive and emancipatory, and ultimately we can work with the text. Um, but I've I've become less and less sure of that, and I, and at least my 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 personal view now is that um, is that as long as the text is there, um, the logic of it will remain, and so and so the only real long-term way forward is a constitution without an Article 22. Tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, do, the question is, I, there's no name, there's Galaxy J7. Don't you think that inherent abuse in the very use of NSA is hidden within the law? Can we therefore bring in modification or abolish NSA as there are already sufficient laws there to address the issues addressed by NSA? National Security Act. You know, I think I think that the argument again is, is somewhat um, can lead to undesirable outcomes. And I, I remember when the sed when sedition was challenged a couple of months ago, um, I remember one of the petitions said that you don't need sedition because you have the UAPA, right? So I mean that that is not an argument. You know, like it it, it it's the argument cannot be that that um, that because we have other laws that are there to, to do the same thing. Um, therefore, we can get rid of like X or Y law. I think again, the the and I'm, I'm sorry if I misunderstood the the question um, and got it all wrong. But I think that that ultimately it has to go deeper than saying that we need to get rid of X law because other laws are there that do the same thing. I think the problem is that there are all these laws that do that uh, in in different ways, um, and what they are doing is is the issue. This question is about due process that what in your opinion can be done to ensure due process? Uh, do we need collective legislation? <laughs> or can we accomplish this with just a more humane reading and implementation of existing laws? Okay, I just want to add a bit, maybe a rider to this because I think we have, there is this concern that sections of the uh, judiciary, and I don't want to use terms like lower and higher because I think uh, that's, that's not appropriate. But for instance, the NIA Act being amended you know, in 2012 and 2014, and you have a very dangerous precedent of special courts coming up and then the way they are reading into the UAPA, etc., and also the cri other crimes that are being allocated to NIA. Uh, 
uh, uh, I just want to add that, you know, does it, that, that, is there a need for judicial oversight into the functioning of these special courts when it comes to due process? I mean, I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't think that judicial oversight at this point is a solution because no. from what we have seen is that you get extraordinarily good judgments from the trial courts and terrible judgments from the trial courts. You get very good judgments from the high courts and terrible judgments from the high courts. Mm. You get excellent Supreme Court judgments and also terrible ones, right? So, so I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I, think all, we've, I think we've all been through that phase where we go like, okay, you know, like um, the high court and the Supreme Court don't get it. Uh, the trial courts are, are you know, our are, are first and most important line of defense. And then there'll be a trial court judgment like that Ember's judgment of Safura Zarga, right? Uh, there'll, there'll be that judgment that that just is is just is is, is so. I mean, what do you even say? Uh, then we go okay, like Supreme Court is too far removed, but let's like trust the High Courts. The High Courts cannot oh. get it. And then the Kerala High Court goes into that. Uh, the Kerala High Court, the judgment of January this year, right? Where um, yeah. where they, uh, I think it was someone had a book, and it, it was again again one of those just extraordinary. But yeah. in fact, the the High Court set aside. A special court judgment. Special court judgment, you know? exactly. Yeah, saying that the special court judge acted like a constitutional court. So, so I think that that um, it, it's just I think what we have to acknowledge is that the that for a number of structural reasons, and that's a whole different I think discussion. Um, we don't have uniform, coherent jurisprudence on these issues, and so what you will have is that if you're lucky and your case comes before a judge. Um, and the judge could be in the trial court, could be in the high court, could be in the Supreme yeah. Court. Uh, if it comes before a judge who is minded towards protecting the constitutional right, you know, to personal liberty, uh, then you will get a, a good order that interprets law in a way that advances, uh, in my view, rightly, uh, the cause of liberty. If you get a judge who is unconcerned or, or you know, or executive minded, um, then you will get the other, the other way around. And and as I said, I think the problem is that the that the constitutional text and the, and the constitutional culture that's been there from the beginning doesn't prescribe either outcome. So, so you know, yeah. both of those are equally defensible internally on the touchstone of the constitution because the constitution specifically provides for um, Article 22, right? Um, so I think that that judicial oversight um, it, in itself isn't a solution unless we are simultaneously working towards a, a constitutional text or a constitutional culture where that oversight will mean something uh, in tangible terms. Okay, so there are two questions, one on uh, uh, here and one on YouTube as well, both related to something you just touched upon in one reply, but it's a specific question, so I have to ask it. So therefore, uh, are you saying that we are talking about if the abuse of fundamental rights is built into these laws and it has location in the very structure of the constitution, would it mean that there is a need for a basic review of that? the constitution amendment to the constitution i mean you i, I know that, you touched upon it but yeah, that's the question that, yeah no i think i think we need to initiate that conversation i don't know what form it will take um I, I don't know what the outcome of that will be even even among ourselves uh because like i said i think it's it's a big ask um and as and as, as we all know any kind of call to review the constitution comes with it carries with the whole you know whole sort of uh, well, risk, freight, baggage, you know, who will use it for what purpose. So, so I, so I, I, I really don't want to pres prescribe that kind of a thing. But I also feel that, and I felt this more and more over the last two or three months, that we simply can't go on in the old way of saying constitution good, judge is bad, because there is clearly something that's missing over there. Um, and we, we perhaps at least need to, uh, need to start the, the, the conversation about structural issues in the constitution and, and what we might be able to, to do to do about that, um, but but we do need to I think start the conversation about what is you know the constitution and is it really what we think it is? Okay, uh, just for a little clarity, okay. But I, I'm fully um, uh, that when you had Tada and Pota both, and those were kind of the legislations that got repealed again because of huge public pressure. But NSA remained despite the fact that uh, there was uh, there, it's been hugely abused. And state uh, uh, preventive uh, detention laws, national security, um, state security laws remain. Chhattisgarh, Jammu and Kashmir, Afswa remains. But when Pota and Tara regime was uh, was was in force, you had uh, in that sense, the argument is that there was a sunset clause to these 
acts and you had a judicial review committee. Okay, you had a judicial, I'm not talking about judicial oversight now, but a judicial review committee, whenever there was an obvious abuse <coughs> of the use of that law. Mm. While we keep initiating the more fundamental uh, campaign mm. and thoughts that you have raised, mm. should that also be now looked into and read into and demanded about the existing laws till they get repealed? Oh, right. So no, I mean, I think that I think there are a number of there are a whole number of short term things that that yeah, can and should yeah. be done. I think the first thing is to I think the first thing is that the Vatali judgment needs to be uh, you know relooked and 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 reversed. Um, you know, well, I don't know. That's not really short term because it'll, it'll take some effort. It's always hard to to ask the Supreme Court to review its own judgment and to reverse it. Um, but but I think you see more and more how different high courts. Um, and the Supreme Court are really, I think, beginning to understand that, that look, this is unsustainable. Um, and so to that extent, you have the Supreme Court judgment, I've forgotten its name, uh, but the one that said the fair, the right to fair trial um, yeah, yeah. You know, continues to um, to operate. And so therefore, Kashmir, it was frankly, a rose out of Kashmir, yeah. Right, yeah. So if you basically have, like, if you have somebody in jail for like two, three years, trial hasn't begun, then even... It was the longevity of the... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So then the fair trial, right? So 43D5 then will not be a bar. So you have yeah. that. You have Justice Bambani's judgment uh, presently in a strange limbo because it is not the not been, not been stayed, but is not to act as precedent. So I mean, yeah, I, I, I'll go into a rant. So <laughs> let me not. Um, you, you have we'll all go into a rant. We'll all go into a rant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have all those judgments. That I think um, I think are, are really good examples of judicial craftsmanship. Um, you know that that work with the constraints of the UAPA and while maintaining a fidelity to the text and to interpretive canons, uh, nonetheless craft a jurisprudence that still allows for those spaces to exist. I think you have all the lawyers who are doing an amazing job, I think, you know, kind of putting forward those interpretations. So I think that all of that obviously needs to continue. Um, and in that way, uh, as I said, the worst abuses of, of laws like the UAPA can still, you know, uh, be mitigated if, if you have a jurisprudence um, develop that uh, that despite that is like a, a, is somehow against the grain of its text. So you know, so so that's I think that's I think a really important thing going forward. I think a lot lot of in, uh, legal effort um, has already gone into that, and it, it's showing results. So yeah. yeah, and at great cost to human lives. I mean, at great cost to human lives. But the lawyers at uh, that that band of lawyers is doing an amazing job. A few more questions about them, which is great because the discussion just gets more uh, more interesting that way. That uh, Karuna, don't citizens brave enough to dissent live in fear of such laws? How does more information about the rights of the activist citizen when police or government threaten them with action under UAPA, NSA, etc., how can this be made more easily available? Oh, I think that, that they should just be, and I think they already are, uh, but I think that maybe the dissemination is not as wide because of resource constraints. But there are a lot of primers that exist. Um, that exist uh, that, that that really set out what is to be done from the start to you know the finish of this process, um, and I, I think I think I think in fact just recently I remember from from Bombay a group of lawyers had made a very detailed note uh, starting with with um, with being detained you know right through the various stages. Uh, so I think that 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 um, translated into a number of different languages and made available is, is important. And of course, it's easier said than done. It's all all requires effort and resources. Uh, but I think that those primers are, are there. I, I've seen a few of them. Uh, maybe it's because I'm, they're just on all these lawyers' WhatsApp groups. But but uh, but yeah, we should we should I think um, work to disseminate them more broadly. And I'll I'll, I'll ask uh, I'll ask people that I, I know who are working on them to what the status now is. Yeah. Thanks so much. Is there anything, another question, is there anything, and this is uh, Rhythm Bwaria, is there anything the courts can do to at least hear habeas corpus petitions challenging executive detentions under public, public safety acts within a shorter period of time? There are no checks on the judiciary. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, when the constitution was being framed, uh, there was a member of the constitution assembly, a pretty famous one, I've either Thakur Das Bhargav or I've forgotten who it was, uh, but they basically wanted a one month, one month uh, maximum period um, for uh, for hearing a fundamental rights challenge and deciding it. Uh, and if you look at Latin America, Amparo cases against state state abuse, 10 days is 10 days is the maximum time you have to decide the case in. Uh, so I think that 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 is really important. Um, and I don't know if it Needs to come into legislation, or because I, I I don't I don't I don't see how the Supreme Court can 
pass a judgment saying that like if that to say every habeas corpus case must be heard in 10 days i think that, that that i don't see that happening so i think again maybe it's something that maybe like it's a, a project of like le- legislative you know um uh, addition to statutes or yeah something of that kind but i think that that the time barred um requirement to um to to hear uh, habeas corpus cases is important and as and as the latin american example shows it's not something that's outlandish i mean jurisdictions yeah. have done that yeah can put uh, this is nil kunj can can putting heavy fines on the state in case of acquittal decrease the number of cases since very few cases ended up in proving the accused guilty in such cases <laughs> yeah no i think i think that's a great that's a great point um, and uh, in in many jurisdictions you have this whole concept of a constitutional tort um, where a uh, violation of constitutional rights is framed in the language of tort and therefore compensation is required to be paid for a breach of constitutional rights uh, in in india it was tried a couple of times i think it was tried specifically in 2014 involving the akshardham blasts when the people yeah. who uh, were, were were accused and were put in jail for for like 14 years 14 uh, and 14 years and then the case went to supreme court unfortunately it went before uh, i think the then chief justice deepak mishra who uh, who dismissed the claims for compensation and i think set a pretty bad precedent in that in that regard uh, so i think that there is that bit of a bit of struggle there to to get to a point where the supreme court um, accepts kind of like uh, as a principle um, compensation across the board so we do have it in some cases um and and we do have like a few cases that talk about it but i think it doesn't get established as a constitutional doctrine um and doesn't isn't and isn't anchored uh, in something like a constitutional tort so i think the next step is to is to get to that point but i think it's it's a very very important uh, step and and specifically if you individualize the obligation to pay compensation uh, and not have this vacuous thing of the state will pay compensation i think that would be a more effective deterrent um if it was actually crafted as a legal remedy you know all these legislations or whether it is uh, pota tada nsa uap afsfa they all have clauses where they say that if the uh, if the prosecuting official uh, stroke administrator stroke whoever is acting in good faith then no action can be taken against them so they have built into these in, into these statutes i mean this of course it doesn't have to apply to compensation but they built into these statutes and protected officers uh, right from the investigating officer upwards who might maliciously continue pro- prosecuting a, a person or a group of persons and the protection is built again into the statute yeah so the problem there exactly is that you have to prove to prove that the officer wasn't acting in yeah. good faith which yeah. is yeah. a very hard burden to discharge that's right that's right you 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 will almost never have a smoking gun uh of that kind that will show it i mean what you look what you actually looking at is like a leaked conversation or something that shows that it's actually a person was going after somebody yeah, because otherwise yeah. the officer can always just say that look honest mistake i mean we thought the evidence was there and it wasn't but we thought it was and what else were we to do other than prosecute and in fact it just shows the system is working because we prosecuted and the court acquitted them so i think you have that it's really hard to get over that um that hurdle um of course the answer then is Uh, is a more is a more uh, broad based compensation yeah. um regime yeah, that, that yeah, yeah, absolutely. Through, but but then yeah, that yeah. leads to the whole problem it's not really a deterrent anymore because then yeah, effectively it just tax yeah. plays money going back right so that isn't really a deterrent so i think you're, you're caught between the problems of establishing individual complicity in malicious prosecution and non deterrence of state compensation and and that's kind of i think the, the dilemma that that's there there's a comment from anjana prakash ma'am i would uh, who said that i would think that the only remedy is that the courts ensure that procedure established by law law court and court meets the basic tenets of criminal law like presumption of innocence or the structure of courts is not disturbed this because we know the pretext of procedure established by law is really the source of abuse yeah no i think i think i think that that's completely right in the sense that that uh, and this reminds me of justice khanna's uh, line in the in his dissent in habeas yeah. corpus is the history of of personal liberty is the history of sticking to procedure right um yeah. I, i i don't want to also sacralize procedure too much there is a risk in that but i think that right now um i think right now i think what's what's interesting is the historical point after the pilr in 1980s onwards uh, 
where this whole thing the supreme court kept saying well procedure can't stand in the way of of justice you know so we need to do complete justice therefore you know x or y procedure standing in our way we will kind of ignore that but the impact of that is goes beyond just pil right it goes to a general disavowal of procedure and when that bleeds into criminal law uh, you know where where justice then is is kind of community justice protecting the public uh, catching the guilty it becomes so easy then to say that in the interest of justice uh, things like default bail right uh, things like those those time limits on 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 filing of charge sheets and so on which you would hope that the court would interpret very strictly against the state uh, it becomes easier then for the court to say well in the interests of justice uh, we will not let these procedural uh, hurdles stand in the way of effectively prosecuting the case so i think that that a, a renewed focus on um on the importance of procedure uh not just as something that is a hurdle for the state but as something that really maintains the equality of arms uh checks and balances state, i mean the uh, basic checks and balances right checks the yeah, checks and balances but a little more than that and that <coughs> the the, the uh, inequality between the individual and the state when the individual yeah. is arraigned in the dock as an accused in a crime is so great uh that there has to be something that mitigates that inequality and procedure is something that does that uh so i think that that to maybe really stress the importance of that um would i think would be a, would be um yeah that's that, that's i think that's necessary few more comments got a lot of comments coming in from youtube as well uh, that uh, uh, the, uh this is uh, surekha talari saying that it cannot be a fixed definition of national security it is time sensitive it is circumstance sensitive it it it, want, it it involves all mega and micro factors that impact citizens in given time political terrorism or dissent is very a very narrow approach towards na- to define national security national security needs to be defined by the supreme court very clearly just now it is being interpreted as per the government's convenience as long as it goes that way the law will always be abused yeah i mean i think that that it you're right in that it's obviously being interpreted by the state as it wants to and the court is deferring to that that definition uh, but i don't know if the court defining it is a, is a solution because i think that that um the, the the court defining it you're still going to have the state enforcing it or implementing it and i think you can see the so in raman over lawyer's case right um, the court drew this distinction between law and order uh, public order um and uh, the concentric circles yeah, the right concentric concentric. circles right so it do it do it do that distinction now and it's a distinction that i think i have loved to cite i think we lawyers really love love it like we you know we keep we keep making that point in in especially in court um and it it has helped sometimes but i don't know if if it really stood help help like in in kind of a long term way against uh, the encroachment that these uh, that these kinds of of statutes do because these kinds of statutes are premised on the assumption that they are responding to the gravest of possible threats uh, you know so so you're no longer in a situation where where you can say oh actually um you uh, you your, your your competence or like your 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 constitutionality of it depends on this law being a public order law but actually it's only a law and order law therefore like you know it has to be struck down i think that those kinds of arguments were as useful at various places um when you're dealing with the kind of 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 things happening under UAPA um you know and the and the NSA and i mean i mean here constitutionality i don't mean you know so if justice bambani's judgment is an ex- is a great example of actually like defining terrorism in order to ensure that you can't just grab people under UAPA and put them in jail so as narrowly as possible defined exactly. as narrowly um, as cons- 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 consistent with its ordinary meaning of course so so um so i think there's a place for that in individual cases uh but i think that a uh, uh, you know the general purpose definition of national security uh, by the supreme court i'm not sure of how much how much it will help at least like with, with that <coughs> why can't we repeal such laws using article 21 <laughs> i mean i wish we had answers to that <laughs> i mean the unfortunately they've all been upheld on our article 21 yeah. ground so i think that that ship has sailed yeah 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 uh this is uh, an interesting question from pradyuman singh do you think it will be dangerous to enforce the natural rights of life and liberty that exists outside the text of the constitution in cases that attract national security laws 
This is in the context of the Puttaswami judgment that expressly overruled ABM Jabalpur. <coughs> Yeah, I think that I, I would tend to agree. I think that that, um, that looking at at nat natural rights outside any kind of uh, constitutional, structural, historical argument is a dangerous proposition, and I, I think that we should be alert to its dangers. Um, rights are always contextual; uh, they have a history to them, uh, a specific political, social history, and ultimately they have to be anchored in you know in something. So, so I agree that that even though this this sound intuitively plausible, and 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 the argument often is that uh, you know that that um, oh, if if like tomorrow the constitution is gone, then natural rights, uh, you know, are going to still be there and help us. Which I'd say, if the constitution is gone, then I think we'll have bigger problems to worry about than being able to establish like natural law in court. So I think that that um, that, but I think they can be used to a lot of harm. And in fact, if you look at some of the arguments in 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 that are being that are often made in the US, uh, you know, and and in in certain parts of Europe, where they actually invoke natural rights to advance a really conservative, um, narrow uh, understanding of, of rights that excludes a whole range of people, including women. You know, um, I think that that we need to to be on our guard against that kind of thinking. We are now <clears throat> sort of, uh, uh, I think, at the end of our questions. I just wondered, uh, Gautam, that given the questions, whether you would like to just make some concluding remarks uh, in terms of where we could go now before I uh, then just make one or two points and hand over to the chair. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that I think that um, thank I mean, questions were all great. It was a pleasure responding to them, and some of them, of course, I think are impossible impossible to respond to because. The answers are beyond, you know, any, any one person. So I think that that um, I'd say maybe three or four things. I think first of all, I'd say that that all the lawyers who are doing these cases are doing a, a wonderful job. And and when you when you follow the proceedings, you know, uh, in court, uh, you know, I think I think that that within the constraints of what these laws can enable them to do, like they're doing the utmost. So I think that 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 is is great to see, and and that will of course continue. So I think that 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 will continue on its on its own trajectory. I think I think beyond that, there are maybe uh, maybe it's worth thinking about short term, medium term, and, and long term goals here. You know, so short term, of course, is to is to is to push um, and advocate for a progressive reading of these statutes on the lines of what Justice Bambani did in his judgment, on the lines of Justice Tipsey's judgment, and to try and like demonstrate how these pro this interpretation is consistent with with constitutional safeguards. That's the short term short term approach short-term solution. Uh, medium term, of course, is I think that there are all these precedents, uh, Vatali and maybe even Kartar Singh and those kinds of cases, uh, to see how there can be a concerted uh, argument made uh, to rethink uh, some of these provisions that, uh, these judgments that have, I think, entrenched the executive centric view of uh, of of these uh, these laws and, and those four things that mentioned, the four pronged approach. So to see if we can kind of, you know, um, make a case for why that's wrong and inconsistent again with constitutional safeguards. I think the long-term solution, as I said, is maybe to initiate a conversation on the constitution, uh, the constitution's design uh, and structures, and and how they do or do not perhaps enable this to happen, and what a resolution might look like. And I think all these three can take place, you know, side by side. Um, yeah. There was one more question which has just cropped up that uh, it's about Bhima Korigao, so I can't resist asking it because we do have some time. Yeah. It is even when the accused are taking it upon themselves to establish their innocence, for example, the way the Bhima Korigao accused have presented the Arsenal report, which is a clear example of, you know, uh, not just tampering with evidence, but actually malware kind of manipulating evidence to, a, to the nth degree, is the failure of the courts to even take cognizance of the report another case of a miscarriage of justice um i think that's been the writ petition has been filed on that i, I it's I'd, been I'd, filed but i think there's been a yeah. delay and you know right. it's not been heard it's before the high court it's pending in rona yeah, wilson so and shoma sen's case yeah yeah so i mean i, I mean i think the, the delay of course you know is something we've seen is a recurring problem um and I, I can just say, I hope that that's taken into cognizance. Uh, uh, and, and I just want to it. add that because I know a little bit about it. That I don't think it's just the courts. I think the states in transitions, you know, the state, it's apart from NIA and the union government, even the state of Maharashtra, in even trying to test the Arsenal report vis-a-vis -vis their own independent uh, 
uh, some local experts using what the Arsenal report has come out. It's like you don't even want to look there, which I think is really irrational. That if a set of evidence has been uh, put before you and it's from a US, it's a highly specialized uh, experts from the United States, you need to retest that, right? You need to find out whether it holds true. So I think at least it behoves on the state government or state agencies, the central agencies to refer it to refer it, the findings of that, to independent experts who are uh, you know, based in India or wherever, whomever they may trust. But to kind of completely deny that you, you're going to even look at it, I think is really uh, part of the problem, it's, uh, which, which is hopefully will be addressed by the courts as and when it's heard, you know? Uh, yeah. So thanks, Gautam. It has been really a privilege and a pleasure. And has always given us a lot to think about, though it's not an easy, easy way out. As you say, it's a very tricky uh, tricky road in a way, but uh, it's not something one can turn away from. Uh, you, made the, you made the time, you took a lot of uh, energy, addressed all the questions. Thanks very, very much for that. Uh, for all of us, for all of you who've been listening and who've been with us uh, uh, actually and uh, uh, remotely, this is the third of the four series that we've had in the lead up to September 5th, as you know. We've had uh, uh, Professor Nageshwar Rao in the first panel whose who's work on the constitution, taking it in Kannada to the people of Karnataka was, has been quite, quite a, a movement in itself. We are very grateful to him. Uh, we also had a very, very interesting panel discussion last Sunday on the whole issue of you know, the, the challenge to the media uh, and surveillance and uh, you know the st uh, deep state with the whole Pegasus exposure and the fact that not, I mean, uh, not mainstream, but we like to use the word big media is trying to drown out whatever the real media is trying to say, these alternate channels, alternate voices. And we had uh, Probir uh, Purkayasta from NewsClick and we had Siddharth Vardarajan from The Wire and myself. It was a very interesting panel discussion. And now we have today. So third very, very uh, important uh, 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 lead up to September 5th. And next Sunday, just to let all of you know, is also going to be quite, quite special. We urge you to join us and uh, uh, what we thought we would do because it's September 5th, the day that Gauri was uh, uh, killed is that we get, uh, we, we get, uh, and she was really, Gauri really related to young leaders of our time, you know, and who were showing us the way with so much courage. Gautam is certainly one of them. But I remember the way she related to Kanaya, to Jignesh Mevani, Umar Khalid, uh, Shaila Rashid, when the entire when JNU was being attacked in a brutal fashion, so we thought it was only fitting that next Sunday we have with us uh, Asif uh, Iqbal Tana, Devangana Kalita, and Natasha Narwal in a kind of a live engagement and uh, uh, conversation about Gauri and about their own incarceration because they become iconic role models for all of us, and that will then lead on to one more lecture by somebody whom we hold very, very dear in the human rights fraternity, senior counsel uh, and a dear, dear friend, Mihir Desai uh, from Mumbai, who has been amazingly um, among the band of lawyers who's been looking into many of these very, very difficult cases, particularly the Bema Korekmao case. He's also vice president of the People's Union for Civil Liberties, PUCL, uh, and of course, a human rights lawyer and activist in his own right. So that lecture will be next Sunday after a kind of uh, engaged evening with the, our three young student leaders. So we urge you to join again. But before I hand over to Professor Vishridhar for his concluding chairperson's remark, I want to, from all of us, thank Gautam Bhatia very, very much again for again opening up a lot of uh, uh, ideas, questions and challenges for us. Thank you, Gautam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tista, uh, for uh, moderating this session wonderfully, bringing all the questions. As you said, uh, Gautam Bhatia's lecture today was, in a way, a prelude to what we're going to have next week, which will be, which will be focusing exclusively on the UAPA. Uh, Gautam Bhatia has raised a number of pertinent questions looking at the whole issue of constitution from various angles, from the colonial to the post-colonial times, and how certain fault lines have um, stayed in the constitution. So it's not a question of some judges being good, some judges are being bad, or taking subjective positions, but we have to look into the fundamental 
fault lines within the constitution. So it's a very, very important point that needs a lot of debate, of course. And uh, it's also, you know, we have to tread very carefully now, particularly with the present dispensation, which is also talking about changing the constitution. So the whole burden of demanding a revision of the constitution to protect human rights, to uphold the basic tenets of constitution has to tread very, 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 uh, it has to be tread with a lot of caution. So I think there was this element in his talk today that while we need that kind of revision, we should also think a lot. It should, uh, it should not lead us to a um, more chaotic situation. But what actually uh, um, matters to us today is that, as he pointed out, there are those four issues that he main talked about or that can describe the special act, the National Security Acts. So one is the executive uh, supremacy, the demise of uh, the denial of remedies, the jurisdiction of suspicion. It's a very a nice, nice phrase that tries to encompass uh, how today mere suspicion itself is enough uh, to make somebody uh, you know, lose his rights or her rights and then can be branded a criminal for life. And then at the end is the public welfare itself. Um, the public welfare is supreme. So this whole idea of who constitutes this public and how is that this public is about people? Because people also as individuals matter, collectively they can become public. But once we uh, hang on to very amorphous concepts like the nation and the public without taking the people involved there, it can take us to very dangerous spots as it has uh, been so, so far. So we can, um, so the preventive detection itself, in a way, as he said, is also a way of um, criminalizing people without proving anything. But that's one of the most uh, uh, dangerous thing, one of the things that need, we need to be concerned about. And uh, in a way, uh, we can say that uh, when it comes to the National Security Act and the this UAPA and TADA and many other special laws, which have been there in one form or the other since independence and more so since uh, emergency, we see that they have only tightened the screw. And uh, in a way, some of the basic things like human rights, the right to life, right to free justice, etc., are becoming a kind of footnote uh, in our life today. So the constitution seems to be very silent about that, as if it has to be evoked by only good people, but by itself it can, it's become very pliable. A constitution that becomes extremely pliable can be a problem. And we have seen, uh, we have been a witness to that kind of stuff now. So, um, where is the way out? The way, is, the way, way out as see hinted at in his speech is to begin a debate about why constitution needs to be rethought. That debate needs to be, you know, we should begin that debate is extremely relevant and important. Of course, taking all the other precaution. And certainly, um, while constitutional remedies, constitutional reframing are all important matters, uh, perhaps ultimately, uh, this debate will also should be strengthened a lot by people's movement because these debates cannot happen in isolation in academic circles. It has to emerge from people's movements and people's concerns. So let's hope that let's, we'll never lose hope on that. So let's certainly hope that the people's movement will emerge. That will take up this issue of the revision of the constitution so as to strengthen the constitution. So we need to reread the constitution to save the constitution because saving constitution should also mean saving the dignity and uh, life of the people of this country. So with this, I think uh, um, I will conclude my remarks and I certainly 
look forward to the session next week, which will in many, many ways continue the debate that we have had today. And on behalf of Gauri Memorial Trust, I would like to thank Gautam Bhatia for having spent some of his very precious time with us. And also, more importantly, for sharing his thoughts, which are very, very relevant today. And there's a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Tista, for having brought these people together, for having conceptualized this kind of series and then conducting them on this series so, so well. And all the participants and who logged in today and who are also part of the live streaming, I'm sure that this debate will be there in the YouTube for people who missed it today. So we um, hope to see all of you next week for a lively discussion and above all to listen to those youngsters who are the victims of this UAPA, but have managed to come out because their experiences matter a lot to us. So good night. So I look forward to meeting all of you again next week on 5th September. Thank you. So Deepu, um, are we concluding anything? Uh, yeah, I yeah. think I think we should now conclude the session. Uh, yeah, we should. Yeah, thank yeah. you, team CJP. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Deepu, so much for everything. Thank you, friends at the Gauri Memorial Trust. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the technical support and everybody else who.